attention to James chapter 1. When I first started looking at this book to kind of go through it uh, as often as possible, I read several times that James is the type of book that gets you right where you live. And man, that was an understatement. <laughs> I am finding more and more, and, and we're still in chapter one, but more and more that James has a way of looking at us in the Christian life and challenging us with 10 or 12 different tests of true believers. And the application of that just seems to hit home every single time we look. In this passage, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. As I mentioned just a little earlier, this is the third um, test of a true believer. The first one we looked at in chapter 1 began in, in verse 2 and went to verse 12. And it was a response to trials. Then the second test of a true believer, in verses 13 to 18, a response to temptation. And then here we look um, this morning, a response to truth as it's revealed in God's word. In this third test, we see James reveal some attitudes that we would look for in response to this third test. And, and that attitude or attitudes that come with this involve our willingness. Our willingness to receive the word with submission, willingness to receive it with purity, and willing to receive it with uh, humility. Receive it humbly. This, when, I, when I first saw this word willingness, it really caught my attention because part of what I do for organizations is to help them get their people to do what they want them to do. And that may come in the form of using a new piece of software or it may come in the form of a different work process. But either way, part of my responsibility is to get the workforce able to do what they need to be able to do and then also willing. And these are two completely different things. You may go to a training class or read a book of how to do something, and you may be able to do that. But because of different reasons, you may not be willing. Able has to do with, with skills and, and knowledge to be able to complete a task. Willingness has to do with um, a desire. It has to do with overcoming resistance or maybe fear in order to complete a task. So ability answers the question of can you. Willingness answers the question would you or will you. So how does this relate to us here today spiritually? If God has imparted his spirit into you and you have responded by faith, if he's brought you to believe and you have come from spiritual death to spiritual life, then you have the ability to respond to this third test. God has granted you that ability to receive his word, to understand his word, now the question that lies before us this morning 
Are we willing to do this? Are you willing to receive the truth of God's word? And if we are, how? This is what we're going to look at this morning. This first willingness that comes up in our test to receive the word is receiving it with submission. He says in verse 19 and 20, As you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So here James makes a transition, and because we have experienced this transforming power of God in our lives, we have been made new creatures. We are to continually submit to God's word <clears throat> and allowing it to continue its divine work, not only in us, but also through us. Scripture not only is given to bring us to salvation, but we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Look at the things that the Scripture is to supply us with teaching. Now that's not necessarily a difficult thing in and of itself, right? If you've learned something new in the past two or three months, it may have been a challenge for you, but we're able to learn new things. What about for reproof? Yeah, that's a little more difficult, right? For correction and for training. By continuing to hear the life-giving and life-sustaining Word of God, our hearts, indwelt by God's Spirit, are stimulated to respond and to obey with willing submission. We see in Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Another psalmist wrote in, in uh, 119 verse 11, 111, we have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. No matter how well the mind may understand the knowledge and truth, it will be of little spiritual benefit if the believer if the believer's heart is not inclined to embrace this truth and to submit to it, that is willingness. That's the difficulty of this. We can stand and read God's word and say, amen, amen to this. What happens when I may not be living by that truth? What happens when Brother Bill is faithful to teach us God's word. What happens when there's something that we may believe or think that's contrary to that? Well, then what do we do? Do we submit our will to the scriptures? We certainly need to spend some time understanding and discussing and studying those things. In the second half of verse 19, James gives us three important commands for the believer who is willing to receive God's word into sub in, in submission. The first one is quick to hear. We are to be hearers. But what are we supposed to be quick to hear? I'm, my wife would appreciate if I was quick to hear her. That doesn't always happen. Some of you did not have to laugh out loud. <laughs> she would appreciate that. And it's good for me to do that. And in our study in Sunday evenings, we've certainly seen that it's good to do that. But here James is talking about us being quick to hear God's word. We are, to, we are able to be quick to hear but quick to hear God's word is a little bit different 
nuance. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. What does this mean to be quick to hear? Two thoughts were, one, to seize every opportunity to increase exposure to the scriptures. What does that look like? If I'm going to commit myself to seize every opportunity to increase exposure to the scriptures, where is it possible that that would happen? Wherever that's possible or where I need to be, one place certainly is here. Exposing myself to the teaching on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Not because it's more holy if I come those days, but because I'm trying to take advantage of every opportunity to be exposed to this word. To hear someone teach this. To think through it. To have discussions about it. To figure out what does that look like when I live that out in, in my life, in my circumstance. These are very profitable things. The second, to take advantage of every occasion to read God's word or to hear it faithfully preached and taught. We can hear God's word here, certainly, but we can hear God's word any place. I mean, you don't even, you don't even have to, <clears throat> you don't even have to, to have Wi-Fi connection, right? I mean, the scriptures can be downloaded on your phone. And, and if you don't have a phone, if you don't have any electricity, we, th th this is readily available in our language. When we begin thinking through how to apply this, here's where it gets personal. What are some things that we could do that would allow us to honor God's word in this way, by being quick to hear. The first one is present. Being present for worship. Being here. That's one way that we can exercise our ability and our desire to be quick to hear. Maybe, maybe just even being here um, at 1045, ready to begin. And teachers, we've got a challenge, right? We've got a challenge. We've got more material than we can get through on any given Sunday. <laughs> so that's the challenge. We need to be diligent to make sure that our folks are walking out of our class at 1030. We want to enable them to be quick to hear not only what we have in Sunday school class, but the primary gathering uh, uh, corporately is for this preaching time and our singing and practicing worship in all of those different ways. What about prepare for worship? This one hit me. Do you normally read the passage to prepare, engage in prayer and worship prior to coming here? I'm not faithful in doing that. I mean, you know where we're going to be, right? We were in 1 Corinthians for almost two years. You know exactly where we're going to be. Now, the one in others is a little bit different, because I think that's going to span in different books. But even preparation, you know what we're going to be talking about, right? It's right here on our bulletin, one another. Looking up those passages. Asking God, deal with me concerning this passage. Another one I thought of was participate in worship. Worshiping through hospitality, through singing, worship in giving, being engaged fully. Remember, our audience is the Lord himself. Do I participate or do I kind of reluctantly attend? Another way that we can be quick to hear is making this time a priority. Again, I've done this. 
How many times do you grab your cell phone and start looking through Facebook right here in the middle of a service? Get distracted by someone that sends you a text, and so you send them a text back. Or allowing ourselves to be distracted by someone else here. Now, I fully understand that we have children here, and this is a long, long time to try to sit still and to try to sit quiet. <laughs> it's hard. But the responsibility here that I'm talking about lies on me. I can become distracted by that, but I don't need to continue to be distracted by that. Right? That's my responsibility. I mean, if something happens, I can, my attention can be diverted for a moment, and then I can come back and say, remind myself, no, I, I need to focus, because I'm here to be quick to hear. That's my priority. The sincere, eager desire for such learning is one of the surest marks of a true child of God. So first, we must be quick to hear. Second, he mentions slow to speak. When the believer who, is, who willingly receives the word with submission must also be slow to speak. How many of you would classify yourself as a talker? Okay, how many of your spouses or people that know you would classify you as a talker? Sometimes for some reason, we're not really willing to own up to that, but other people will certainly, <clears throat> certainly tell us. I'm a talker. Sometimes that really gets in the way of me hearing. This characteristic is a companion of being quick to hear. We cannot listen carefully while we are talking. It just can't happen. We can kind of hear while I'm talking, <laughs> if someone else is talking, but I can't really hear. Many discussions are fruitless for the simple reason that all parties are paying more attention to what they want to say rather than what others are saying. Proverbs 17.28 speaks of this. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. Chapter 29, verse 20. Do you see the man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. In any field of, of knowledge, we learn by listening. Now, we also learn by doing, but we learn by listening also. However that is, it's not by speaking. In this context, it seems that slow to speak includes the idea of being careful not to be thinking about my own thoughts and ideas while someone else is trying to express God's thoughts and ideas. It has the context of more <clears throat> in a teaching time. So right now, what if I just said, stop! Were you already distracted? <laughs> it's just so easy. Our attention just kind of wanes back and forth, and that's just natural. So if I'm really going to be quick to hear, and if I'm going to be slow to speak, it's got to be intentional. It's not something that's just going to happen. We cannot really hear God's word when our minds are on other thoughts. Because our minds naturally drift, our own thoughts, we are distracted by others. And we have to, to practice this idea of being focused and quiet on the inside as well as the outside. There is another important thought on this topic of being slow to speak. So if we're going to be slow to speak, it implies that we will speak. So when we are to speak, what are we to say? The primary idea is that when the appropriate time to speak does come, 
What is said should be carefully thought out. When we speak for the Lord, we should have the greatest consideration that what we say is not only true, but it is spoken in a way that both edifies those who hear it and honors the Lord. After all, we are speaking on his behalf. If we are his ambassadors, we are speaking on his behalf. The third that's mentioned here, we should be quick to hear, we should be slow to speak, and slow to anger. Anger at a truth in the scriptures that displeases is one way that this anger is contained in this word. It's not necessarily an explosive outburst of anger. It's kind of this idea of seething. And again, it's in the context here of God's word being taught. Maybe something that confronts a sin or confronts a cherished personal belief or behavior that I have. And, and rather than submitting myself to the scriptures in that, I pull back and I seethe. And it builds up. In this context, James seems to be speaking particularly about anger at a truth in the scripture. It refers to a disposition that's hostile to the scriptures. And it's manifested maybe only inwardly against those who faithfully teach the word. There certainly is an anger that is just, holy, indignation against sin, Satan, and anything that dishonors the Lord or assaults his glory. But mere personal anger, bitterness, resentment can never achieve the righteousness of God. It does not accomplish what is right in God's eyes. That is especially true when the hostility is against the truth of God's word, for that is actually against God himself. So here we have this first attitude that's necessary for believers to rightly receive God's word a willingness to receive it with submission. The next is a willingness to receive it with purity. We see that at the beginning of verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. This putting aside here really kind of has the idea of having put aside. All filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. This is a condition for receiving the word. Before God's word can produce its righteousness in us, we must renounce and put away the sin in our lives that stands between us and that righteousness. Peter writes about this in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up in respect to salvation. We need to be willing to receive God's word with purity. Filthiness is any sort of moral defilement or impurity. Moral filthiness is a serious barrier to our being able to clearly hear and clearly understand and comprehend God's word. It may reside in the heart for a long time before being experienced outwardly and in fact may never be expressed outwardly. Hidden sins that only the Lord and the individual are aware of. The idea 
of confessing and repenting of and eliminating every trace and every aspect of evil that corrupts our lives. When this is done, we can receive the word as 1 Thessalonians 2 describes, the word of God, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. The third willingness that we have attitude is to receive God's word in humility. We see this at the end of verse 21. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. James declares here the true, that true believers will be willing to receive God's word with humility. That is, putting self as well as sins aside. I told you that James has a way of hitting us where we live. It is a type of spirit in which we accept God's dealings with us as good in so much that we do not dispute nor resist it. And this is not easy. Among other things, humility includes a very important component of being teachable. It's almost an idea of voluntarily placing ourselves under one's authority. In this particular context, it would be the authority of the under shepherd that God has sent here on his behalf to be his spokesman. The faithful Christian who receives the word implanted with a submissive, gentle, and teachable spirit, cleansed of pride, resentment, anger, and every form of moral corruption is a faithful Christian indeed. We have been saved or justified through the power of the word of God. We are kept saved or sanctified through the power of the word. And we will ultimately and completely be eternally saved or glorified through the power of the word. And we see this laid out in, in Romans chapter 8. The question that we have to consider this morning is, am I willing? Again, if God has placed his spirit in us, we are able. But are we willing? Are we willing to receive God's word in humility, <clears throat> in purity, And it's pretty easy for, for us to sit here and say, yes, I'm willing. Sign me up. Well, that's the Christian thing to do, right? Are you willing? Yes, I'm willing. But how does the way that we live actually answer the question? That's what James is hitting at here. Do I live in such a way that I am quick to hear, to hear God's word? Am I a careful listener, making sure that I pay attention in order to get the message right? Do I live in such a way that I'm slow to speak, so that I say that I'm supposed to say and speak for whom I'm supposed to speak? Am I slow to anger? Do I have a tendency sometimes to resist the word that's preached? Do I let that brew and seethe inside of me? Maybe even perhaps so much so that I have disdain for the messenger that brought the truth. Have I put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness? 
I don't think any of us can answer yes to that one. Constant battle day in, day in, day out and day in, day after day. To wake up in the morning and say, Father, I want you to have your will and accomplish your goals in my life this day. Casting Crowns had a song years ago. At the end of the day, I want to sign my name knowing that my heart was pure. Do I receive God's word in humility? These are the questions that James is asking of us in this passage, in this, this third test. This test of responding to the truth of God's Word. Good things for us to think about, to contemplate, maybe to make some decisions that we're going to engage in a different way in being quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. If you're here this morning and by faith you've embraced Christ and committed your life to following him, these are things that we need to, to hear and not only hear that we need to embrace. If you're here this morning and you've not placed your faith and trust in Christ, that's the first place to start. And the good news is it's not too late, not yet. Will you demonstrate this test by, receive, <clears throat> by receiving this truth? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to be able to come and to, to, to engage in your word to allow your spirit to work in our hearts, to call us, to teach us, to reprove us, to correct us. And Father, I pray that we would desire to engage in this third test that James presents us responding to the truth. Enable us by your spirit and encourage us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will stand.